may have been expecting an elder and you're getting a yelder, which is a young elder. Uh, I'm sort of on that path and, and folks do come to me for a number of traditional things and uh, traditional or not traditional, not traditional understandings, but certainly understandings that are no more enlightened than any of yours, but that uh, when viewed through the lens of various sort of systemic, not sort of, but various systemic uh, systems of, of oppression and racism, uh, folks sort of say, holy shit, how did he, how did he do it? And I, I, I've never actually articulated it quite that way, but I work with some young folks and, and even I, I look to them and when I was their age, I'm, I'm very much what they are at their age. I, I was very much them. So I didn't know much about my culture. I didn't know much about my identity. I just had, thankfully, I had that small little bit of, of fire inside that truly fueled my desire to know my identity. And thankfully, the, the, fan, the, 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 the fanning of that fire came from my mother and came from my father. When I would look at, at, at my mother, she was, uh, she, she was, you know, in parliament doing politics uh, as a woman in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, that kind of work didn't always happen for women. Uh, and of course, I'm sure that she has a number of stories that demonstrate the various things that she had to experience, especially when you think of the, the social climate at that point in time was not nearly as sensitive and inclusive as, as what we have now. And even now we have lots of work to do. Uh, and then my father, uh, he, you know, I don't know why he didn't teach me Ojibwe. Uh, I kind of think that he, I kind of think that he thought too that the Ojibwe language was not going to help me. Uh, so I don't know my Ojibwe language either. Uh, but with that said, I, I don't, I'm not angry with them because I've begun to understand more and, and greater uh, substance and, and greater well, greater understanding uh, of those things that caused my parents to to not know their language to not know their culture not know their identity to to struggle with those very same things that I continue to struggle with even at 41 years old and with children of my own so an interesting thing that 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 we have today is if we were it's still on the books now even now with the Indian Act that um, indigenous people are not allowed to uh, go into pool halls, billiard halls, you know, where you shoot pool. So the Indian Act actually explicitly states that. There's a book that out called the, the 25, 25 Things You Didn't Know About the Indian Act. I, I just started, I just heard reference of it the other day. For the second time, I'd forgotten about it. But uh, and, and I, I, the name of the individual escapes me. If one of the folks that are, uh, that are, uh, if Hannah or, or uh, one of you folks could look up that book and give us the artist name, that would be great. Uh, but yeah, there's some pretty amazing things there. Like if you if you left the reserve to uh, to do anything, you, you, in many instances, you had to get the the first the prior approval of the Indian agent. The Indian agent was effectively a person who governed over all of these indigenous people. How they arrived at the at the reservation was that they 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 had. Uh, I keep on thinking it's called consolidation. It's not. It's centralization. Centralization here in Nova Scotia meant that Mi'kmaq people who initially roamed, uh, you know, we, we lived on the water during the summer months and, and fished and, and lived well and, and happy and healthy and then moved to the interior to protect, to pre protect ourselves during the, uh, the winter months. Uh, in order to act, by this point in time, the numbers having been dwindled down, uh, the government presented this option of centralization in which Mi'kmaq people could report, effectively report, or, or go to uh, three communities. Some say four. I, I haven't confirmed that yet because I haven't sat down to really look, but uh, three or four communities. One of them was Sabag and Agadee, and another was Millbrook. Uh, another was, I believe it was Picto Landing, and the other one I think was uh, maybe member two. So once you arrived there, 
uh, that's when you when you enlisted uh, into uh, Indian status, and then the the apparent benefits of the Indian Act would would then kick in for you. So you were given you were promised you were promised land and a house. Of course, the land and the house was hardly anything to write home about. My mother tells a story of. Uh, uh, I've had elders tell stories of uh, laying on straw beds in like the 19, you know, 50s and stuff. There, there's no plumbing. There's no, there's no electricity. You go to the well to get your, to get your water. This is, of course, occurring as the, as, as the much of mainstream Canadian society has all of these things, uh, for the most part. Uh, and where it's not where plumbing and electricity is not available, the, the the housing is still you know much more adequate than what was ever on a reserve. So when my mother tells a story of uh, having moved from St. John, New Brunswick, to uh, as a child as a tiny child uh, to uh, to Sabaganagadi, and the reason why they had cho- and at that time it was called Shubanagadi. Uh, the reason why my why her parents chose that community was because there was uh, there was limited uh, relatives there. So it's understood that the, the community in which you choose to reside is going to, uh, not to say that that was during centralization because it wasn't, it was, it was afterward. But anyway, the point of it all is that they chose that specific location because they were able to build a family knowing fully well that there's limited amount of all, uh, relatives already there. Um, but she tells the story of looking up through the, through the ceiling and hearing her mother downstairs, uh, clear as a bell crying, uh, and her mother sitting by, my grandmother sitting by uh, a table with a candlelight. There's no, there's no lighting. Of course, they lived in St. John where they had lighting and plumbing and all this stuff. And so they arrive there and uh, they're very, very scared. And she said she can remember looking up at the ceiling and seeing uh, in between the cracks of the paneling, the, 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 the stars under uh, uh, above her, which is which is an interesting story to share with you all because uh, tonight we are we are indeed going to engage a little bit about the uh, the Mi'kmaq and the cosmos. So, um, but yeah, you know, like that's sort of a, a bit of a snapshot of the immense progress that we've we've made as a people uh, as Mi'kmaq to to from then to today. Uh, my mother's seventy eight years old now. And, uh, you know, she, she, she called me today and she was said, I'm getting in my car and I'm off to Truro, you know, and I said, oh, okay, mom, you know, so she's, she's very up and about and very uh, energetic and all that sort of stuff, thankfully. And, uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's remarkable when we say like indigenous people, you know, they need to get over it or, you know, it's, uh, that happened a thousand or a, a long time ago. It, it really didn't. There's people walking around uh, that experienced it firsthand. So to think that, Indian residential school was a uh, was something then there's nobody walking around feeling or having that living memory is is uh, inaccurate and I think that's a narrative that we uh, we as well I say we but mainstream society uses in order to validate and justify uh, a lack of accountability uh, we we all have a hand in uh, uh, the history of Canada, and we all have a responsibility to try to rectify as best as we can. Whether the and, and I and, and I don't expect folks to start donating to every damn cause that you find or whatever. You know, uh, the Kyber's a good cause, so please do donate to them. But you know, the it's important to not. Uh, have those conver- that it's important to have those conversations around the dinner table with our own family members and children and maybe even going so far as 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 saying you know hey uh you know uh, i mentioned earlier hey uncle kenny like that's a that's a homophobic thing that you just said you shouldn't say that when we look through our 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 society and our friends and family even we see that like the generation before us may not have called out those sorts of things they may have just said whoa that's that's a terrible thing to say and then the generation before that they just didn't they just didn't touch it at all they acknowledged like that's a bad thing to say or do but we're not going to touch it the generation before that may have just perpetuated it so there is a there is a progression that is occurring and i'm hearing more and more young people actually speak out against these sorts of things to say i'm not putting up with your shit not in my house and not in my space so we're on the right track i hope 
Um, but yeah, the, that's a little bit about me, how I've come into being a, a what I call a young elder or a yelder, I jokingly said, uh, I'm, a, I'm a sun dancer. Uh, well, I, I've sun danced, so to speak, I'm not currently uh, sun dancing, but I, I was a sun dancer. Uh, I've learned a few things there. I do have a, a, a sweat lodge and uh, we, we are not doing any sweats at the moment because of COVID, um, but I'm trying to find ways around it. And then I think uh, much of the academic work that I've done around uh, Mi'kmaq people, uh, Mi'kmaq and, and our history is uh, perhaps comes through as well. And then also my experience at the, at the post-secondary level. Of course, there's individuals from whom uh, I, I stand upon their shoulders because they're giants and, and Daniel Paul and uh, Patty Doyle Bedwell. These are all uh, people, as a matter of fact, uh, 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 our Kyber folks, if ever you want to have a connection to Bernie Francis or any of those individuals, please do let me know. I'll be happy to put you in contact and then you guys can do this all over again. But with uh, with an individual who is far more uh, versed and understood uh, within these uh, academic circles than myself, I hope to one day be there. Uh, but with that said, that's a little bit about, about me. And uh, so thank you for sitting through that. Um, I do want to acknowledge also that you know, I mentioned the Indian Act earlier and meeting in groups like this, if if we were all indigenous individuals and it's impossible to tell who's in, who's indigenous at this point in time. So it's important to never ever, uh, and I've learned this the hard way as a young person growing up, the way a person presents is certainly not necessarily it's who they are, uh, who they who we assume them to be in terms of their gender identity or in terms of their nationality. So we may have individuals who present as uh, not necessarily looking as indigenous as myself or as Mi'kmaq as myself, but you know, uh, it's important to acknowledge that we don't necessarily know uh, any of that and not to judge one another. Um, but it's interesting when we talk about indigeneity, if, if this group of individuals, uh, if this was in the 1950s, we would actually, and we were indigenous, we would all be broken up because according to the Indian Act, groups of any groups larger than three were not allowed to meet together because it was thought that groups of three, any groups larger than groups of three, were, they were practicing their culture and their identity. And the Indian Act was intended to strip away that very thing and, and what they describe as being enfranchised, meaning that you are no longer within the, uh, the you're not separate from Canada as an indigenous status person, you are a Canadian and you for you forego you you uh, submit your your indigenous status. And what I mean by that is if you became a, a priest, if you became a nun, if you uh, became if you chose to go to become a lawyer, if you chose to go to school, uh, if you uh, I think doctor as well and military. So if you if you were an indigenous person who wanted to be in any one of those careers, you had to become enfranchised and in coming and becoming enfranchised the the indian uh, the the indian act you, you no longer applied to you and thus the 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 canadian government no longer had to fund uh for that specific individual when we look at indian status we see that uh, individuals get married and if the, uh, uh, an indigenous woman who had status if she married uh, a non-indigenous person she would lose status and if she but if you look at blood quantum and they had children the children would in effect be half Mi'kmaq half blood quantum Mi'kmaq so to speak but then we uh, but then they wouldn't those children would have what's called an O2 status so there's O1 full-blooded where both parents are, are indigenous and O2 status is where one parent is indigenous okay now if that O2 status decides to marry uh, or have a child with another uh O2 status, the status becomes O1 again. But if the O2 status has a child with somebody who does not have status, the, the child born loses status entirely. And there's, there's it, it's all a way of, of taking the number of indigenous people uh, lower and lower and lower and lower. So I just wanted to recognize that having this group together is a special thing in of itself because it's in effect, it's, it's revolutionary. There, there was a point in time where groups such as these would not be allowed to even occur here, right here in Canada, right here in lovely, beautiful Canada. Yeah, 
it, it, that's the way that, it, that it, not that long ago, that's the way that it was. So what we're doing this evening is pretty special. Uh, but that's enough of all that of all that stuff. I, I know that we uh, that probably wasn't in the synopsis, so I, I apologize if you found that less than engaging. Uh, but if you have any thoughts or comments, please do uh, feel free to to share them. So if you've taken your your packages, um, oh, and I should offer an opportunity now. Does anybody have any questions or anything from what we were just chatting about? Okay, yeah, a little frame up. Okay, if you do, feel free to jump in or, or type your message there. You have some squares. Uh, take your squares and begin to lay them out, all right, in your space. If you don't have enough space to lay them all out, that's okay. I'm just suggesting that we do it that way to start. What we're making is called prayer ties, in English anyway, they're called prayer ties. I don't think there's any Mi'kmaq word for them. And as a matter of fact, these are not a Mi'kmaq um, these are not Mi'kmaq in origin. My mother, I asked her, when, when did you first start seeing uh, prayer ties? And she said, oh, you know what? I started seeing them in the 70s and uh, it was from out West. So my understanding is that these are uh, a, new, a newer sort of way of expressing um, innermost feelings, thoughts, uh, and that sort of thing. So I use the word prayer. Uh, it's not exactly a word that resonates with everyone. And I understand that. But what this is really about is that human experience and taking a moment to be the humans that we are. And you also have a, a, some tobacco or some sage there. You take your tobacco or your sage. If it's sage, you just you just crush it up a little bit, so it almost it looks the same idea as the tobacco. You know, break it up a little bit, and you take one of your squares. There we go. Okay, and that just is placed in the middle. If you have multiple squares out, take your tobacco or your or your sage that's broken, and you break it up, and make sure that you have enough to put into each each one. So I'm going to make this one. So you take a moment and, and begin that process. And then we'll go on to step two. The idea with these is that, you know, when we say uh, uh, it, it's effectively the almost like, a, I don't know if the correct word is personification, but um, it makes the prayer tangible or the feeling. So we don't have to be in a happy place and we don't have to be in a sad place. We can be in those places. We can be who we are as human beings in this moment. The one thing I ask folks to do is to not come with anger or no, not even anger. You can be angry. You can be pissed off about the government. You can be pissed off about whatever. But, but this is an opportunity to look for a solution and not, and not, and not find ourselves with anger and hatred. Okay. So it's, it's believed that among Mi'kmaq, it's believed that items that can be carried upon the person are typically, or, or can be, items that can be carried upon the person can also be imbued with spirits. What I mean by that is that rocks, pipes, bags, all kinds of things if they're valuable, if they're, if, they're, if they're of significance to that individual, it is thought that oftentimes spirits may inhabit that thing, that object, uh, and thusly creating it to be even that much more, elevating its, its, its value and, and that sort of thing. So when we make these sorts of things, those feelings that we may be experiencing, they can come in, they can come into these. And so we want, to, we want to fill them with good things, and we want to fill them with the things that are hurting us to take it away. It's both of those things. But what we don't want to put in here is anger. I'm not anger, hatred. You can, we can put our anger in here and send our anger and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow it to be here. Live here, in a way, and I'm going to let it out of me now. Or we can say, you know, this is for uh, uh, Eleanor, uh, a person who I loved very much who's passed away. This is for my brother who also passed away. This is for my father who's also passed away. That's, we can, we can, this is an opportunity to feel that connection happening. Okay. So that, 
and that that requires us again to, to to be that vulnerable human being and vulnerability is not something that we regularly exercise so it is can be a challenge for folks okay so take your moment take a a small pinch of that tobacco or or a piece of your of your sage and and i'll only use the language that I'm, that I'm just used to using, you know, say a prayer or, or say some thoughts or words or, or however you, even if some, like, a, you know, some people say to me, like, how do you, like, what, what, what happens when you're done praying or you're, or you can't think of what to pray for, then just be in that moment and, and feel the feeling, live with the feeling. That's okay to just have that feeling for that moment and take that feeling and place that feeling into your, into your prayer tie. And so, Initially, um, I, I think I, I, my communication with you, uh, Bria, may I, I may have mis, mis, misunderstood you or misguided you, but if we had the, the number that we initially had was 13. Any idea why I chose the number 13? Knowing fully well that uh, the name of our workshop involves the word cosmos. Uh -huh. Any ideas? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The moons, the moons, the moons. Yay. And just like that, I won't be going to Kate anymore. I'll expect answers from all of you and not just, just Kate. Um, yes, indeed, the moons. So the interesting thing, I joke with Kate because I, I know Kate well. Uh, the, the interesting thing about the moons is this. Um, so take your, your square. And you may have some elastics there as well. If not, that's okay too. And you take the opposite corners and you bring them together so they make a, a sort of triangle. Okay. And then the remaining corners also come up to those two. And that gives you um, some sort of a, so if you can if you can pull it together and bring it and then and then squeeze it. And then take one of the little the little elastics and simply wrap it around the prayer tie. Okay. So the end result is that I call them little ghosts almost, right? They're like little ghosts. That's the end result. Okay. So our packages. Um, intended, uh, the intention was 13, but that's okay that we only have two. That's fine. We can still continue along. How many moons in a year? Any guesses? I mean, anybody know? I see somebody, I see uh, Benny Welter Nolan holding up number signs with fingers. That looks like, that looks like, is that 13? 13. <laughs> okay, good. You know what? In, in most years, so when we, when we look at, uh, uh, Bernard, uh, I think it's Bernard Gilbert Hoffman who wrote this uh, ethnography about indigenous, about the, uh, the Mi'kmaq uh, in 1955, he, he wrote a thesis about it and from which he pulled uh, from a number of uh, resources and, and researchers from the, from the era, uh, I believe it was the, the 1700s, somewhere around there, uh, Rand and uh, who were some of the other ones, there's a few of them anyway. And one of the things that Hoffman noted was that it is, it is uh, Hoffman uh, noted a pas uh, passages that described how Mi'kmaq people measured time by the moon cycle, even in so much that every 30, I think it's every 36 moons or so, basically every around every three years, there was an extra moon that had to be added into the cycle in order to maintain the order of time. So this is sort of the idea of, of a once in a blue moon kind of thing. Um, and, and we know today that that is indeed the case that there is this once in a blue moon every, I think it's three, I think the number is 36. I have it in my notes that I'll be sharing with you here shortly. So we know that there's a level of sophistication that's involved with looking up to the heavens and seeing the stars and knowing how to read them and acknowledge that there's an, an amount of time that associated to each one. So each lunar moon runs about 29 to 30 days. I'll be looking away as I go through some of my notes here. 
uh, a 13th moon added actually every 30 months. So every 30 months, there would be this 13th moon that would cause the order of time to return back to uh, the monthly moon phases. Uh, so yeah, it, it clear, uh, that, that 13th moon occurs uh, once between two and three years. Hoffman continued, the, they count the years by the winters, the months by the moons, the days by the nights, the hours of the morning in proportion as the sun advances into its meridian. The meridian, of course, being the halfway point between sunrise and sunset where the sun is directly above us in the sky. And the hours of the afternoon according as it declines and approaches its setting. They give 30 days to all, to all moons and regulate the year by certain natural observations, which they make upon the course of the sun and the seasons. So spring in, in, in our ethnography is, uh, is, is uh, the Mi'kmaq word is uh, Benaya, Sigui. The spring was considered to be one moon and would happen around April. It would happen in April. It was during the month of April that they began to see the leaves sprout, which is what we're seeing right now. Wild geese again appear, again, we're seeing that. And then uh, it's also noted here, the size of the pregnant female moose, seals bear their young and bears begin to reappear. That's where we're at right now. Summer, Nib, is five moons. It's noted during this time of year that salmon run up river, wild geese shed their plumage. Then comes autumn, Taoak, which is one moon and it's in October. Waterfowl return from the north to the south. And then finally winter, which is Gezik, is five moons. The cold becomes intense, the snow is abundant and bears hibernate. So the natural order and course of, of the environment uh, in, in conjunction with the observations of the moon uh, gave way to an understanding of time. So, I, and I, it's funny, the more that I research these sorts of things, I, I, it comes, becomes more and more apparent that Mi'kmaq people, uh, or Mi'kmaq, I think some of the, what would later become stereotypes may find their roots in, uh, in Mi'kmaq society, uh, particularly like many, many moons. Uh, maybe that's maybe that's something that found its origins here. Uh, there's also some discussion that uh, mag magazine is uh, uh, another word for moccasins, and that it was perhaps first said like first sh the term was first shared between uh, colonizers and indigenous people here in Nova Scotia uh, with the Mi'kmaq. Um, so the moons. They combine one moon of the spring with those of the summer and one moon of the autumn with those of the winter. Since in fact, it can truly be said that there is little of spring and of autumn in what was written as Gaspesia or Mi'kma'ki, uh, in as much as the passage of the, in as much as the passage is imperceptible there from cold to heat and from heat to cold, which is very rigorous. So what this is saying, and I think that this is actually, this remains true today that here in Nova Scotia, we go from winter, we have this, this, it seems like this, uh, I call maybe stunted spring. And then suddenly it's, it's pretty warm and then it gets hot. Like it, it, that progression occurs quite quickly. We're going from winter jackets to shorts. It seems like in a, in a, in a matter of, of a few weeks or whatever. Uh, and then I think also once we get into those winter months, it, it suddenly it turns a, a cold snap pretty quickly. So perhaps it's similar. But, you know, I, I mean, I'm not, uh, I, I think there may be something in there about global warming too. So I, I, I don't know. I don't want to speculate too much about it. But uh, I, I do think perhaps there is some, some, uh, some correlation there. Uh, so yes, the, the weeks were measured by one and two quarter moons, the full moon, and then the waning moon. Uh, the year began in October. This is actually an interesting one. So our, our, our year actually began in, Octo uh, in autumn. Uh, and that time, that was called schools, the first moon of winter. Uh, the spring, May, was as ag, ag, I'm sorry, Agisagus, which is the first, mig, uh, first moon of the Mi'kmaq summer, which happens in May. So the moon cycle 
tells us that there, there was a level of sophistication that I think uh, much of our history has blotted out. Uh, when we look at the, at the depictions of indigenous people, we see things that are first viewed as romanticism. We see uh, indigenous people depicted as being helpless and harmless, uh, almost natural like nature, uh, untouchable, fearful, uh, and in need of guidance and safety and saving. After the World Wars and after the Depression, those same Indigenous individuals, that same Indigenous society is in media viewed as being savage, as view, uh, viewed as being violent, as viewed as being a threat and depicted as such. So we see depictions of Indigenous people uh, who are, are bloodthirsty and they want to simply kill and, and steal away your family members and other violent acts. Once again, dehumanizing those individuals. Uh, but when we look at the history, we can see that there's a rich understanding of our surroundings that and that that these sorts of or that these sorts of facts uh, stand in the face of of mainstream depictions uh, of these individuals. So if you're done your 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 prayer ties. You can take the two of them, and you have some. Uh, you have some sinew there, yeah. Some some red string. Oh, where's mine? Oh, here. Some some sinew, whatever color it may be. Is that correct, folks? Yeah. Okay. So you can use. So we have four main medicines: uh, cedar, tobacco, sage, and. Uh, Sweetgrass. Oh yeah, that's right. Sweetgrass. Any one of those can can be put into a prayer tie. Even tobacco is itself. Um, so we get to, like it's so frustrating. I'm happy to have all of your ears because if there's one thing in the world that 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 we can do, I mentioned the thing about sitting around the dinner table and, and explain to folks like you know here's some of the misconceptions and speaking out against these sorts of things. Also though, if we could uh, get a get a voice together about having a sweat lodge in the city, that would be pretty cool. Because as it stands, I can't have a sweat lodge here in the city because of the fire because of fire outdoor fire regulations. Uh, I think that there may be a workaround, but I'm nervous to do it because I feel like if anybody ever saw it, they might give me a hard time. But anyway. Uh, your red string. Take your your sinew, your red your red string, whatever you may have. Uh, and I say whatever you may have. It can be thread. It can be a shoelace. It can. It's up to you. Uh, so when you go to do these by yourself, know that one. This is not cultural appropriation. Appropriation occurs when when we take this sort of thing and use it to uh, hurt the or, or originating culture. Okay, if we do this in a respectful way, it's, it's totally fine to do. Same with smudging. Smudging is something that if done respectfully, then there, there's really nothing, nothing wrong with that. And that's why I give everybody who comes into the center and who comes to our programming, I give them all smudge. I, you know, take it away and, and I smudge with them and let them feel safe in, in doing that because it's not, we're not exclusive in smudging. And there's lots of different cultures that smudge. There's lots of different cultures that use incense. Uh, so it's, it's a, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a human thing. And if done with uh, good intention, then that's all that we can really ask for. You know, I'm not asking folks to uh to to lead the sweat I'm, I'm, here's a here's a uh, some uh, some smudge it's okay to smudge it's okay for all of us to smudge it's okay for us to to uh i can't i can't think of the word but personify our feelings and emotions in this form and and it's okay to uh you know do what we're doing today so take that that prayer tie and tie that secure that fasten that to uh your string you'll want to fasten it so it doesn't so it doesn't come undone again if it does it's okay but the idea is to try to fasten it so that it doesn't come off. So you can double knot it or... So the reason why we're using elastics today is because uh, when I was uh, one year at the Sundance, I was running behind schedule. So they ask us to make a few of these, okay? Uh, they ask us to make a few. They ask us to make about 365. Why would they ask us to make 365? Any guesses? Right, right? Days of the year. 
What? Is there that many days in the year? <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Francesca. Thank you very much. Indeed, the amount of days in the year. For some folks, when we sit down to do this sort of thing, it's also an option. It's also an opportunity to reflect. So maybe we make, um, you know, my my. I think my brothers in past. I don't know how many. Like I'm 41 years old. Maybe I make 41. Maybe a person might want to make nine. What comes in nine? Any guesses? Uh, months of pregnancy months of pregnancy yeah in in some cases not in all cases in some cases some, sorry you're yeah. right that's yeah, no that's right no yeah. you're correct and that that's that was the answer i was going for anyway just so thank you i don't i didn't mean to to correct no. you but but indeed I, I also realize that sometimes when i ask that not everybody goes nine months but in in some cases and in most cases that's the goal is trying to get those nine months and perhaps that's what we do or maybe we have a child in our lives who who uh, was seven months so there's seven prayer ties right or my brother who was uh let me think i don't know how old he was if i'm 41 he probably would have been like mm, i don't know 46 or something like that maybe i make 46 prayer ties for his memory uh so it's entirely up to us the significant something maybe maybe we sit down and make as many as we can until we're done and that's just it and then we go back and count how many that we have broadcloth you can get from uh, from Fabricville for, uh, I think it's like quite literally $2.99 a meter or something like that. So feel free to use that. We do, we do reference four colors, yellow, black, uh, white, and red. And any one of those can be used. But in some teachings, they say to only use the red because the red is the color that the spirits can see. Now, of course, any culture who has lost um, its identity has to reform at it at some reform the, the identity at some point. The Indian Act for 75 years outlawed, I mentioned to you, had outlawed uh, Indigenous people's ability to practice their culture and uh, 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 ceremonies here in Canada. So the Sundance was outlawed. The potlatch, which is a major uh, ceremony out west, was also outlawed. All of it. You could not speak your language. Uh, you could not practice your culture. This gives rise to more and more Indigenous people becoming Catholic because it was during the Catholic uh, holidays that families were then finally able to come together behind closed doors where they would then hopefully be able to speak their language and keep it alive. So you can imagine the covert efforts that were made in order to keep the language alive. Because again, even during those times, Indigenous people were being imprisoned for anything as simple as speaking your language and being off reserve to uh, meeting in groups of greater than three. Uh, so yeah, uh, I see some questions here. Uh, Rory, at the end of this, you yes, okay, yes. So again, I guess I guess you could say that's up to you as well. So I have a question here with Rory uh, in the chat. I, I put mine toward the end. I have a little. Uh, well, there we go. A little bit of slack there at the end, um, and then the more that you have, the next one you put on as well. So you got to tie that one close, uh, or not? You don't have to tie it close. That's 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 um, prayer ties uh, two thousand. That's the second year, but we're not there yet. We're we're still in our first year, folks. So, so no pressure. But yes, the, we used to compete with one another at the Sundance. Sorry, bear with me one second. I dropped one of these squares. Uh, we used to compete with one another at the Sundance. To, uh, to see who could make as many of these prayer ties and make them as close as possible. Uh, so feel free to, to, to try to tie it as closely as you can. But yes, indeed, the number that we choose can be significant to us and us alone. Maybe it's our favorite number. Maybe we're doing denominations of four. Maybe we're doing denominations of three. That, that, the, that part is our optional uh, way of... Um, expressing ourselves and infusing a little part of our own personal unique identity into each of these little prayer ties. But yes, in short, you can use uh, one of the four colors if you would like. And again, you, we, we're, I'll walk through that one more time. You, you, it's not, it doesn't have to look perfect either. So I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But once again, it's, it's just um, corner to corner. And it gives you like a, a triangle, then bring the other two corners up to meet those two. And then we just just kind of squeeze the, the tobacco down to the bottom there. So if anybody ever asks, well, what's a prayer tie? 
Does anybody want to answer that question? Uh, oh, I can't, I can't say. oh, we have another. Do we have Jess? Jess Marcotte, Marcotte, if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, that's me. Uh, so it's a way of embodying thoughts and setting intentions or thinking through something. Good. Yes. Uh, Kate, is that, is that, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> just joking. Yes, Jess, that is indeed accurate and correct. So it's the embodiment, the personification, the, the tangible elements of our insights coming outside. Francesca, did you have something to add as well? I was just going to say it's a physical manifestation of a prayer. Yes, lovely, lovely, indeed. So if anybody asks, that's the answer. It's it's the it's the it's the embodiment, the physical personification. The it's what's on the outside coming to the or what's on the inside coming to the outside. Okay, and so we get to have a little bit of that when we touch this. We know, like even right now, as I as I do this, I, I've been thinking of Eleanor, a, a person who was near and dear, who Kate knows uh, in my life, and so like I feel this, and I'm like, yes, this is this is a part of Eleanor, so to speak, you know. So that's, that's what that is. So once you have them secured, um, and I actually, I have two here, but because I'm so good at it, they're so very tight. You may not notice that there's two of them, but indeed there are two and they are secured. So I jokingly said at the Sundance one year, the reason why we're using elastics, I was telling you was that uh, I was at the Sundance and I was late. Uh, so I was like, oh my goodness, I got to get my prayer ties done because the prayer ties go around the tree. And most recently at the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center, we actually uh, did a prayer tree and, and we've got these, uh, these prayer ties all wrapped around the tree. Uh, I'll pull up a, a picture to share with you folks shortly here of, of a Sundance tree. Um, but I started, I, I, I was running behind schedule. So I took elastics and I started putting them around there and I'd make a prayer tie and I'd set it down and make another prayer tie and I'd set it down. And I kept on doing this and trying to make as many as I could. Uh, because normally what you do is you don't use the elastics, you just use the string and you tie it up each one and 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 that's that's sort of how everybody was doing it. So my my son dance, but we call uh, we call each other's uh, you know uh, uh, brothers or or sisters or, or however that person identifies. Um, I say that, but the reality is the, the Sundance actually needs to do it, its own little bit of uh, growth and progression. So uh, don't be surprised that if you ever find yourself at the Sundance that uh, there is some work to be done there too. But with that said, um, one of my brothers says to me, "Oh, that." that looks so good that that's almost cheating. I said, yeah, I know, right? But I'm, I, I gotta get it done, man. So, so that's, the, that's the story of where the elastics came from uh, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, workshop or this little exercise that we're doing together. Um, so once you, once you have it on though, you can actually take the, the elastics and just cut them off or, or use your finger to just break them off if you so desire. And the reason why we're doing this, and, it, and it's, you know, it's, we're removing the plastic from the prayer tie because we want the prayer tie to be natural. It's not lost on me that this sinew is actually manufactured, right? <laughs> but again, as, as individuals who uh, lost culture and identity, we have to make those, those steps toward reclaiming and revitalizing that very same culture. So I, again, I keep on returning to the uh, the Indian Act. The Indian Act actually banned our ceremonies for 75 years. So you can certainly understand that for some, if you were born during that 75 year period, or worse, if you were born at the beginning of that 75 year period, you likely had virtually uh, no uh, or very little cultural Mi'kmaq culture within your uh, within your daily life. Or like, and that and that was for indigenous people right across Canada. Um, and then we know that the mortality rates are quite high, especially from that era, and it's even more so for indigenous people. So you may have lived and died within that within that seventy five year period without ever having uh, had your your practice your your culture your identity. So um, and then another another thing that comes from that, and I just heard. Uh, uh, Duma Young talk about this today, that he wasn't sure if Mi'kmaq people ever had sweats, sweat lodges. And it wasn't until around the 1700s that the first documentation uh, about sweat lodges that he's ever seen uh, comes about. And uh, 
much like the, there's also an instrument called the Jigamahan and the Jigamahan, um, geez, I don't even know if I can spell that to, to, to Google it. Uh, so we, another misconception is that Mi'kmaq people use drums. We didn't use drums. We would bang on hollow logs or, or on a tree. But post, post-colonial, we used an instrument that was made from um, ash. So you take a piece of ash, uh, a, a rectangular piece, and you form a handle, and then you slice the top part of the ash into uh, thin uh, layers of, well, ash. And then you, you tap it and it sort of makes a slapping noise, you tick, tick, kind of like this. This was an in, a traditional instrument used to, to continue to sing songs and celebrate. And then when the Indian agent came by, you could take the, the jigamaham, which was a piece of wood, and just toss it into the fire and say, oh, it's just a piece of wood. And so this is the birth of, of the jigamaham. Um, I can't recall why I, I shared that with you. There was a point. But anyway, yeah, there's a number of things that, that yes, there, I, I think uh, Lindsay Dawn, uh, has has found some there we go some links here for G- there's how that I spelled Jigamahan good job thank you very much uh, I, I, there's two ways of spelling it here uh, please do have a look at that um, but yeah uh, and the sweat that's why I was telling you about it so the sweat in conjunction with things with measures like the Jigamahan which could be disguised as a as an inch as which was an instrument that could be distru- disguised. Uh, and I mentioned to you that families would meet at church gatherings and stuff like that. Well, the sweat lodge, which initially started out as a way to help when you have a cold or a flu or you're sore, became another space for folks to occupy to, uh, to continue to practice their culture behind closed doors. So that's how the progression of the sweat lodge came into being uh, what it is today. Uh, but again, you know, uh, uh, we, there's, there's even old uh, Mi'kmaq marriage songs. There's very few authentic or historically accurate uh, Mi'kmaq songs because so much of it has been lost. So once you have your two ties, uh, do take the opportunity to, um, when you have time, and if you want to drop by the center, I have supplies for you if you would like to continue to make more of these. Uh, the center is located uh, 217, if I could get the, the center uh, located, I'm sorry, the address is 2178-2158. All right, I got it. 2158 Gottesman, in case you don't, in case folks don't know. And I know some of you for, are from out of province. We do our programming uh, both in person, and there's our, our website, uh, it needs to be updated uh, uh, don't judge too harshly. harshly. Uh, but yes, we do our, our programming both in person and over Zoom. So if you're out, and we do have folks from out of province joining us, so it's not unusual for us to mail things out to folks into other provinces and supplies and things like that. Uh, you know, if as long as it doesn't cost quite too much, and, and I mean, when I say too much, like I can't send everybody, uh, you know, 200 people, $20 mail out. Like, I think my my finance folks may be like, uh, <laughs> but, but for most things, yeah, we can send them out to you and you can join us for, for program. Um, our, uh, I'll share with you, um, our, uh, oh, I want to share this with you too, actually. So the, the, the publication from which I pulled that, uh, some of that language that I was using earlier is here. I like to share this with folks because, there's also a, um, a sort of, uh, how would I describe it? Information is indeed power, and sometimes people don't want to share their information. I, I choose to share that information because I think it's important for folks to know. So this is the publication that I pull a lot of my, my historical stuff from. Um, please do give it a look. It's written in a, in a nice, uh, simplified language, and I don't say that to uh, demean anybody's intelligence. I just enjoy the fact that anyone can read this. You know, most folks are, 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 are this is within their, within their, their, their abilities um, in terms of uh, academic reading. So, oh, and I want to share with you who we are or who, uh, who I work with. Um, I don't know if any of you know about the Facebook. I'm, I'm 41 years old. Um, I've learned to uh, start calling it the Facebook as opposed to, uh, where am I at here? Okay. 
So this is We Are All Connected. That's our Facebook page. We post our monthly calendar there. We do all kinds of different things. Uh, next week, we're doing smudge bowls. Uh, we have guest speakers come in. We do all kinds of stuff around indigeneity uh, and also Mi'kmaq uh, culture and identity. I think some of the other highlights I'll share with you are uh, Patty Bedwell Doyle has come in to talk with us about uh, indigeneity and women and her story as well as, not her story, but she shared with us some details of her, of her life and, and also about Annie Mae Akwash and talked with us about uh, Donald Dal Marshall Jr. as well. Uh, these individuals are particularly key figures within Mi'kmaq community, uh, within the Mi'kmaq nation. Uh, we had uh, Anna Mae's daughter, um, Debbie join us. De uh, no, that's De her sister. Oh, oh no. Anyway, Debbie and her sister, they came to join us. Uh, but, but we have elders joining us. We have crafts and all the other stuff too. And we're hoping to connect with the Kyber to continue to do this kind of work as well, because uh, the Kyber and we were discussing just earlier about expression and how finding that balance between uh, uh, taking a voice that a raw voice that has not had the opportunity to uh, express itself and figuring out like how do I not censor you but how do you not cause collateral destruction among uh, other vulnerable and marginalized uh, folks in community and stuff like this uh, but certainly yes the kyber and uh, and I'm hoping that we are all connected we'll certainly continue to do work like this with that said folks I do have another uh, a story to share with you it is 712 does any well 712 uh, Atlantic time I know some of you may be uh, elsewhere in, in the country or perhaps even in the states or whatever um, I'll share with you uh, a story about Cool Pojot. Uh, cool Pojot. There's many stories about Mi'kmaq people and giants. And this is, this is one of them. It is said that Glooscap, when he departed, first went west, then turned southward, and kept traveling on and on until finally, far to the south, he came to the home of Kulpojat, an old man who dwells in the middle of solitude, broken only by occasional visitors. His name is translated as rolled over with hand spikes. He is without bones and his, uh, his corpulence, I think that's corpulence, is so great that he lies upon the ground in one position unable to move. Twice a year in spring and autumn, he is turned over by visitors armed with hand spikes, hence his name. And tradition has it that whomsoever performs this kindly office, he gratefully grants any request, however difficult of attainment. When he lies facing the north, his warm breath produces those balmy southern zephyrs, which bring with them the song of birds, the perfume of flowers, and the wealth of summer vegetation. When he is turned toward the south, the birds and the flowers follow, and the icy northern winds resume their sway. On one occasion, one of the individuals who turned Kulpojat over, uh, who turned him over, gave as his wish. I would like to live with you always, to bring your water and tend to your fire. Kulpojat thereupon turned him into part of a cedar tree. Every spring, as soon as he turned to face the tree, Kulpojat looks at it and raises his hand. Immediately, the fresh green foliage springs forth into full bloom. When autumn comes, before he turns his back upon the tree, he looks at it again and lowers his hand. Again, the tree obeys his will and its foliage withers and falls off near off uh, Nair is renewed until 
with returning spring, the Lord of the seasons again commands it to bud forth. So sometimes our Mi'kmaq stories really have um, no beginning, middle, and end. They're less so the uh, conventional mainstream sort of stories that we're used to, and more so uh, a statement or uh, an insight into understanding. So that's, that's a little bit about uh, the legend of Kulpucha. Uh, I just want to take a moment to read a, a message that I have from someone, uh, and then I'll determine if whether or not it's something that we can share it as a group. So uh, I will, uh, before our time is over, I'm going to uh, direct message a few folks who have um, uh, questions that I think are uh, more personal. And so we will, we will certainly do that. Uh, and then finally, folks, uh, I have a bit of a longer um, legend for you that I, 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 I'm debating on reading directly or sort of recalling from memory. My recalling from memory, uh, it changes mm, kind of every time because I, I, I feel as though, um, I feel as though it's, it's the natural occurrence for, the, for these sorts of stories and legends to uh, grow and change. Um, there's a story of Papkut Paru. I kind of feel like the name that is within that document, that, I, that link that I shared you to the, it's called the Micmac uh, Ethnography, and it's written by a fellow named uh, Hoffman. Uh, Hoffman uh, uncovered a story, a, a legend about a fellow named uh, Papkut Parut. I, my feeling about the name is that it sounds maybe, maybe French. So we're probably not getting the exact correct name. But the legend describes a chief who uh, is, near, is near passing. And he does. He passes away. When he passes away, he goes to the land of the souls. In the land of the souls, Papku Parut, the, the soul, the guardian of that land, he tells the chief, I'm going to uh, re return you back to your people to let them know that this place exists. And so much to their surprise, to the, the, the surprise of the Mi'kmaq tribe, uh, the chief awakens. And the chief um tells them that of the existence of this place and he says to them this is where i will be and i will one day see you all again there at this place the chief also describes the location saying that it's where the it's where the water meets the sky the chief makes his journey and his successor um goes on to to, to become the chief that they didn't use any names in the story, so I apologize. But this, the, the new chief, he loses his son in death. And so he knows of this place in his brokenhearted way. He gathers a group of individuals together and they proceed to the location that was described by the old chief, the place where the land where the water touches the sky. They travel for a long time. You know, they've gathered their, their arrows, they've gathered food, resources, canoes, clothing, dogs. Dogs were very, very important to Mi'kmaq. Uh, we had a very strong bond, bond with them. Even there's pictures of us, uh, paintings depicting Mi'kmaq people with their dogs. And um, they, the dogs probably came from Eastern Europe. They might've been the Eastern uh, wolf, uh, but that's a whole other workshop, workshop session. Anyway, they gathered this all up and they're traveling along the waters and they're, and they're going and they're going and they're going. Days turn into nights, nights back into days. This idea of many moons, right? Going and going and traveling. 
And then finally, near the end, they're, they're just at their, you know, they're like, well, I'm done. This, is, this place doesn't exist. It can't be real. We've been going for what feels like months. They arrive at this place where in the sky, you can see the, the spirits of moose. You see the spirits of caribou. You see spirits that are within the rocks, within the ancestors. You see spirits and, and there, there's canoes, there's arrows. They're all in the sky glowing this immensity, this massiveness. And they found themselves there where the water met the sky. The chief looks at his group of individuals, says, we're here. We've made it. They begin to come pack things away and, and set themselves up for the evening. But then they're quickly approached by a voice. A voice that says, who are you and why are you here? Well, I'm, I'm a chief and I've come to the land of the souls and seeking my son. So. The voice returns and says, angrily, but you're alive and you being here? is insulting. I am Papku Peru, and I protect this land. I protect this realm. And because you're alive, you can't be here. And your being here is an insult. The chief quickly falls to the ground. So sorry. I do not mean to bring you disrespect. My heart is broken. I come here in search of the soul of my son. Seeing the sincerity of the chief, Papku Parut reveals himself to be a massive giant. And he says to the chief and to the individuals with them, I can see that you're actually you're respectful. And I can see that your heart is broken. So come with me. Oh, I wish to talk with you and show you things. The group, they go together with Papu Peru. And Papu Peru says to them, I haven't had anybody here in a very long time. I would like to be entertained. And so he says, let's have a game of what, what is described as Indian dice in the, in the, in the, the, uh, the text. Um, most likely waltz, a game that's used with a, uh, a, a wooden, what looks like a plate. It's a, it's a mathematical kind of thing. We're actually going to have a waltz tournament soon. So if that's something that interests you, please do let me know. Um, he says, Papku Peru says to the, to the chief and, and, the, and his team and his group of individuals, let us play Waltus. And should you win, I'll have a prize for you. The chief thinks, okay, so if I win, you'll give me the soul. They play, they play, they play. They play for days. The thing about Waltus is that it's a game designed to actually last for days because when, when uh, folks went out on to uh, hunting ex uh, uh, escapades or whatever to, to get food. It could go for days at a time, so maybe even weeks. Um, so this game was intended to entertain you for long periods of time. So they play and they play. They play for, you know, that was one day, it goes two days. They're playing and playing and playing. Finally, the chief wins. Chief is feeling pretty good. All right, Papu Paru. I have won your game. And Papku Harut says, indeed, you've won. And for you, I have a prize. He hands him a, a package wrapped up. He holds the package and he looks at the package. Open it. He opens it. Inside is corn. This is corn. 
This is what the land of souls, this is what we eat, and you can eat it too. Take it back to your people, and forever you will always have corn. This is where corn in Megamagi. Megamagi is Nova Scotia, but like the East Coast. It's um, the people, the land, the fish, the animals, the birds, Let two leggeds, four leggeds, all of us together. That's Megamagi, the earth, all of it. Take it back to me, take it back with you to Megamagi, and you will always have corn. Great Papu Harut, the chief says, thank you for your gift of corn. But I've come for my son's soul. Okay, okay, okay. Let's have another game. Another game. Just, just one more. You know, I don't see many people. They play a game. Another game of Waltus. This time, it goes even longer. Days. Week playing the game together. Finally, the chief and his, his individuals, they win again. Papu Peru, we've won yet again. And now, will you give me the soul of my son? Uh, Peru comes and brings him a package and says, here you go. Here's your prize. Open it up. He opens it up. It's his tobacco leaf, tobacco plant. Oh. And he says, this is Indian tobacco. Take it with you back to Migamagi and you will always have tobacco. The chief says, oh, Lalin, that means thank you. Well, Lalin, for this great gift of tobacco, I will cherish it and I'll bring it back to my people. But I've come here for my son's soul. Papu Peru pauses a moment and looks at the man. Hands him one more small package, not unlike the prayer ties that we've given, we've made here today. Take this with you. Inside here is this thing that you wish to have. But you must understand, if you are to open this, the soul will return to the land of the souls. If you open it, you can open it inside of a space where there's no openings. Chief is so grateful. He rejoices. The people, the the this this team of people is this group of individuals with them. They're all very happy. Well, Alam Papku Paru, we thank you for all of your gifts and your teachings, and we must make our way. They say their farewells, pack their arrows, their spears, their canoes, their clothing, the tobacco plant the corn, and the soul. Off they return back to their homeland, their tribe. They finally return home. And they're, they're arriving and the people are rejoicing. There's happiness, there's songs, there's singing, there's dancing, there's food. The, the group of individuals are all very tired, but all very excited to be at home again. And they're celebrated. It was unknown if the, if the chief and, and these group of individuals even survived, let alone came back. And here they are. And the chief shows them. Here is tobacco from the land of the souls. Plant this and we will always have tobacco for our pipes and for our ceremonies. Here is corn. Corn is from the land of the souls. It's what, the land, it's what they eat. It's how they live. Plant this, and we will always have food. We will always have corn. And then finally, the chief shows. Here it is. The soul of my son. Back home with us. It's at this time that we'll take another break. I'm just, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> I'm sorry. I like to put a little bit of humor because this is a heavy subject. I mentioned how many Mi'kmaq stories are not conventional. This one's perhaps a little bit more conventional, but a little bit, a little bit uh, unexpected. More expected, depending on who you are. The chief hands this package of, with the son's soul to a family member and says, 
go and celebrate him in, in the, in, in, a, in amongst our people, show the people, but remember, don't open it. Can anybody guess what happens next? Right. right. It's sad. One tiny peak. I couldn't, couldn't possibly hurt just to see what does it look like? What can it be within? The family member opens the package. And the soul, it returns to the land of the souls. You see, Papku Peru was trying to save the chief from having something that the chief must also learn to accept. And it's difficult to accept some things. But unfortunately, we also must be able to find ways of coping with these sorts of losses. And so thankfully, the chief wasn't angry. Instead, he understood that this is the natural way for things to be. And so he was able to forgive and move on. I changed the end of that story from the text, so I'll leave it up to you to go and find that section of the text that I've shared with you to see what their ending is versus mine. But with that said, I'll, I will share with you that it's not quite as neat and tight. But I do believe it falls and keeps in within this idea of uh, stories not being entertainment alone, but stories intended to being uh, vehicles of uh, learning and, and, and understanding. Okay. So with that said, folks, does anybody else have any questions or anything? Is it, is it okay that um, to have them like this? Both next yeah. Time? Yes. So if, if they're further, oh, okay, yeah. And the okay, so let's 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 go come back to these. So the thing about these is that these can hang uh, you know, maybe on a doorknob in your house or uh, you know. Eventually, the ideal situation is that these are given to a sacred fire. I say ideal, like I imagine that I have probably greater accessibility to sacred fires than some of you, and that's okay. But the thing is, is that these still continue to remain of the same value, whether it's my hands or yours that makes them. So if you can find a sacred fire and eventually return these, if not, they can actually, they can go be a part of a, a tree outside. Um, you may also, uh, in order to have like, um, it's not unheard of for folks to take like say journals or handwriting or, or, or things like that and burn those as a way of uh, acknowledging the power that it has, but also um alleviating the influence and power that it may have over a person. So they, they'll take a, a journal and burn it. If you want to do the same with these, that's okay to do too. Obviously, it's a, it's a personal thing. Either do it with others that are also doing it or other ones that love you and understand what's happening. So you have a amount of, of, of support there with you. Or if you choose to do it alone, uh, rest assured that my, my mental idea is that as that burns and smoke comes up, the smoke is going up into the air and, and, and becoming a part of our world and up into heaven. Okay. So those are two things that you can do. These can also sit on, on a doorknob or just as a way of reminding you, reminding you of this time that we've spent together, reminding you of, of what you may have been feeling in that moment making these. Uh, so it's really entirely up to that individual as to what they choose to do with these things. I think the one thing to not do is to simply place them in the garbage because your thoughts and our thoughts and our prayers and our feelings are worth, uh, have a weight and gravity and value, uh, very much so deserving of uh, a special kind of recognition. So, uh, you know, find a way of, of respectfully uh, returning these back to the earth. And, and that's probably the best way. And if it's not, if it doesn't happen this year or in the next 10 years, it doesn't matter because one day it will indeed occur. So, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or anything, folks? Well, thank you, Rory, for your observation. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, you know, I, I once uh, I once sang actually at uh, oh, what was it called? Um, Falami's Cafe, Bria, um, Kowacha House. That's what it was called. 
Hawaii House. And that's here directly in the city. And uh, as I was singing, we were honoring uh, a couple of people, among them Falami's father. Uh, but anyway, as I was singing the song, uh, an eagle was it came uh, and landed on the building in front of us. I thought that was pretty crazy. Like, you know, I was like, whoa, that's, that's something that I'm not even, <laughs> I do a lot of traditional stuff, but I've never seen anything like that. Uh, that was pretty cool. So yes, these the you know you mentioned the 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 smoke and the it coming all together. It's it's a lovely thing. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, I also see here uh, a question about the string. Do we tie both pieces of cloth together? Okay, so what I've done here, and I'll I'll just take one off. Okay, so yeah, though I have like what what's called a slip knot or whatever. Um, yeah, you can make them further apart or you can make them close together. With a slip knot, it just slides. So these two are these two are actually they're tied individually though, if that's what that question is. And then finally the placement is really like you, you can tie it at one end and then bring the other one as close as you can. And it, if it's not that close, it's not a big deal. It's really a matter of uh, just getting the two of them on together. And then hopefully, if you ever have the opportunity to uh, to do this again together. We'll, we'll get you some more of these and you can have maybe a whole row of however many you so desire. Okay. All right. Does that, I hope that that answers your question, ML. I think ML is actually gone now, uh, but yeah. Hey, Rich. Yes. Can you tell me about um, when you, like if you remember learning to tie prayer ties? Who taught you? The, I think it was the Sundance. It was at the Sundance. Yeah, I, I I may have made them prior to that. I'm not didn't really know the the real significance of it. Uh, I think our pri as we grow, uh, our priorities can change. At that time in my life, my priorities were not my own identity and culture in this way. Um, so I think that the the Sundance was largely the first place that I think I actually sat down and made these with intention. So. Uh, and and we were, and that's when it became that's when I began to realize the significance, especially when you see. Oh, and I wanted to show you a Sundance tree just to give you another visual. So, do folks see my Google image uh, search for Sundance tree? Can I get a thumbs up? Do you folks see that? Okay. So, off to my right here is an example uh, of a Sundance tree. Uh, when we look at uh, this one, uh, a stylized photo to the right here. Along the trunk of the tree, these are prayer ties. Okay. So there you, that's, that's what a Sundance tree looks like. And that's why we have to make so many of them. And then if I can, if I can recall, maybe, I'm not sure if I can. Did this page update so you folks can see that? Here's a series of prayer ties tied together in various colors. Do folks see that? So that's sort of what your, your prayer ties uh, may look like. Um, oh, there's other things that come up here uh, when you type in prayer ties. So I'm going to stop sharing that. But uh, yeah, that's an idea of what prayer ties look like. Yeah. Right. Oh, the internet, you strike again. It's been an absolute pleasure together. For any of you who may have uh, messaged directly, uh, I will respond to you here momentarily. And uh, I thank you all for coming along and being a part of this. I look forward to potentially uh, seeing you all again in various capacities. And uh, it truly is uh, very lovely to have shared the space with you, um, you know, on a Friday night. Like, it's really, really nice. I was looking forward to this. So thank you for joining us. It's been my absolute pleasure. Walali. Walali is what we say, well, means thank you all.